You're open. So I'm, I'm going to today give a, a, a somewhat idiosyncratic introduction to Kavanaugh homology. Uh, no cubes will be harmed in the making of this lecture, and it's possible that I won't even say the word homology, except in the phrase Kavanaugh homology. Um, I hope the, the experts will be amused or interested, and the not yet experts uh, won't suffer too much for the idiosyncrasy. Uh, there'll be examples, so uh, we should be okay, I, I hope. So what is Kavanaugh homology? Can everyone uh, at the back, by the way, see my writing if I use this font size? Are we okay? Okay. So Kavanaugh homology is a categorical not invariant, or let's say link invariant. So what does this mean? Well, this means that uh, if we have some link, so here, a link, we associate to it kh of, of the link. And we're going to think of this as an object in some category. Uh, which for the, today I'm going to call C star because I needed to come up with a name. Now, what, uh, what do I mean by categorical? Well, say that I have some isotopy. So sigma is some surface with two boundary components. One boundary component is one link. Another boundary component is another link. Not only do I get objects in this category for both L and L prime, but I get an isomorphism in this category C star associated to the isotopy. In fact, well, that's what I would want to mean by a categorical link invariant, but for Kavanaugh homology, you actually get a lot more, and I'll, I'll talk about that some tomorrow. Uh, not just isotopies between links give us maps in the category, an arbitrary cobordism between links will give us some map, not necessarily an isomorphism, over in the category. Now, we can look at this object that we get in the category associated to some link, and we can look at its representative in the Grotendieck group. So I'll come back to this a little bit later and tell you exactly what I mean here. It's representative in the Grotendieck group of the category. And the thing that I'm going to say is that this Grotendieck group is actually just Z of QQ inverse. And if we identify the Grotendieck group with Z QQ inverse, then this representative here is exactly the Jones polynomial uh, of the link that we started with. So this is the sense in which Kavanaugh homology categorifies the Jones polynomial. I guess I should fill in one more arrow here. Since these guys were isomorphic objects in the category, they automatically go to the, uh, the they automatically have the same representative in the Grotendieck group. And uh, this is sort of one way of saying, well, isotopic knots have the same Jones polynomial. They don't have exactly the same Kavanaugh invariant, but they have isomorphic invariants. Okay. So I'm actually going to spend a few minutes now talking about the Jones polynomial, more or less. Because the point that I want to make is that uh, any time you have a braided tensor category, I'm not actually going to bother saying exactly what a braided tensor category is. For those who know, you already know. For those who don't know, it's better to just look at the example I'll show you next. Anytime you have a braided tensor category, you get a link invariant right away. And the Jones polynomial is an example. The braided tensor category is the Temple Leib category, which I'll tell you about. Uh, okay, let me just uh, interrupt myself for a moment. Uh, 
there are lecture notes, which are basically a superset of everything I'm going to write on the board, which are up at the back. Uh, if you didn't get hold of a copy, you can probably still get a hold of a copy later. But there's also a copy online. If anyone has a computer out in front of them, you can look it up right there. OK, so the Jones polynomial is an example of, of this setup. And Kravonov homology is two. And this is the, the approach that we're going to take to defining Kravonov homology here. We're going to sneak up on Kravonov homology uh, by, by producing a braided tensor category. And that braided tensor category that we produce will be, in a, in a certain sense, a categorification of the category that, that gave us the Jones invariant. Uh, and I'll show you exactly how you can take Grotendieck groups to get from this braided tensor category we'll produce back to the original Jones polynomial one. And then Kravonov homology will fall out by the usual recipe. OK, so. Let's, uh, let's just define temporary leave. So this is temporary leave as a tensor category. And we'll come back to the braiding in a moment. So the objects of temporary leave, I'll just say, are the natural numbers. So now I need to tell you what the morphisms from one natural number to another are. So here, we'll write home from n to m. And let me just introduce some notation that's unnecessary now, but will be really helpful later. I'm going to write a little open circle up next to this home. This symbol is meant to remind you of the symbol people usually use for composition. Uh, the reason for this is that later, once we're categorifying, there'll be two different compositions going on, and it's important to keep them straight. So I'm going to use a hollow circle for one direction and a filled-in circle for another direction. Uh, so I'm, even though we don't quite need it yet, I'll write that for now. OK, what's this? Well, this is ZQQ inverse linear combinations of pictures that look like this. Uh, so here there are n points at the bottom, n is the source object, and m points at the top. If you ever get confused, I'm always reading from bottom to top. Uh, Etc. Modulo a, a relation. Uh, modulo, anytime you see a diagram with a circle in it, you can take that circle out and replace by, by q plus q inverse. So this diagram is, a, is equal to a, a sum of, of two other diagrams with some coefficients. OK. Uh, I guess I need to tell you, if I want this to be a tensor category, what composition and tensor product are. Let me just do this by some quick examples. Uh, you just, to compose, you just stack diagrams on top of each other. So this one goes on the bottom. This diagram goes on top. And then I remove circles for factors of q plus q inverse. And you can see that I end up with a home from 2 to 2 by composing a home from 2 to 4 with a home from 4 to 2. And tensor product is just sticking diagrams side by side. Uh, OK. So you can note, if you want to, that uh, we can never produce circles as we tensor things, because we never actually join up any strings there. OK, now, this is this next board where I'm going to tell you about the braiding is where I'm going to run into a little bit of trouble. And the reason I'm going to run into, into a little bit of trouble is that I would like to tell you that there's a braiding on this category, that I can make this tensor category a braided tensor category. But if I really do that, I run into all sorts of awkward difficulties. So I'll do something 
close. So here we go. Uh, to tell you that it was a braided tensor category, I'd have to give you a formula for a crossing. That is, some way of writing a crossing in terms of, uh, of these morphisms in, in Templi Leap. I'm not actually going to do that. I'm going to give you a formula for two different crossings. And well, let me just write them down first. Now, uh, if, you, if you know and love the language of braided tensor categories, you could just think that what I'm doing here is defining a functor from oriented tangles into temporally lieb, which isn't quite the same thing as giving you a braiding on temporally lieb. Um, but if you, if you don't know and love braided tensor categories, just think that this means that I can take a, uh, an oriented diagram of a tangle and interpret it as some element of, some, some element of temporally lieb. Okay? Uh, and this little infelicity is kind of going to run through the, the whole talk. Um, there is a fix for it, but uh, I decided the fix was, was not worth the injury. Um, the same problem that, well, I can, I can tell you about that later if, if you're interested. Okay, so as soon as you've got these formulas for braidings, I can just give you the first, the first exercise, which is a, a, a really easy one. You should just check that, uh, that all the Reitermeister moves work out. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm assuming that the majority of the audience has done this in one form or another in the past. Okay. So, uh, let me just remind you now the the details of how you get a knot invariant once you have this sort of setup. Uh, to get a knot invariant, uh, just think of your link. In, uh, in the home space from zero points to zero points. So any link. lives in here. Now, in some sense, that's not very useful right out um, because we don't really know a priori what this, this home space is. But the point is that in the case of Templi Lieb, well, what's a home from zero to zero? Some diagram where there are no boundary points. So it's just a bunch of circles. And each circle is just Q plus Q inverse. So every diagram in this home space here is really just an element of Z Q Q inverse maybe times the empty diagram. So this is just that. And of course, in the Templi Leap case, uh, when you think of your link in this home space and identify the home space with this, this is the Jones polynomial. Okay. So we're going to now start doing the same thing uh, for Kavano homology. Try to see Kavano homology in this setting as well. The, there'll be a slightly bigger difficulty there uh, in, in making some sort of identification like this, realizing that the home space we end up living in is actually something nice and sensible. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so l l l sorry, maybe I should have done a, a really easy example. Oh, sorry, yes, I meant to repeat the question. Um, I actually can't remember the exact wording of the question, but, it, but essentially it was asking me to, to make a little bit more explicit what exactly this, this recipe is. And I'll do that by, by just showing you an example. Um, here's one of my favorite links. Uh, so all that we're meant to do is, uh, is think of this as, well, actually maybe I should do a slightly more complicated link. Um, 
How about this one? Uh, what I meant to do is think of this as, uh, as built up out of lot of, lots of little pieces. So in the middle here, there's a crossing that's oriented that way. At the top, there's a little arc. At the bottom, there's a little arc. And over here, I could think of it as built out of, out of a bunch of bits, of bits and pieces like this. OK. Each one of these little bits and pieces, I know how to interpret as, uh, as an element of, uh, of this template lib category. Well, maybe I didn't say this explicitly, and I should have. The rule for all the bits that aren't near crossings is just forget whatever orientations you see. But on the crossing, sorry, I shouldn't have erased those, uh, you just replace this crossing with the rule, for the, uh, the rule for the crossing that I had over here. So let's see, that one is a negative crossing, so we have to use this rule, but we've got to rotate our heads by 90 degrees sideways. So this is negative q to the minus 2 times uh, that element of temporary leave minus q inverse times this element. OK? And then uh, plus, yeah, thanks. And then we take both of these diagrams and replace the circles with q plus q inverse and end up with some Laurent polynomial in, in, in q. OK. So to, in order to tell you what exactly we're aiming for for Kavanaugh for homology, let me just remind you what the Grotendieck group of a category is. So I, I know that I'm calling it a Grotendieck group, group, but I'm going to say that it's a, uh, it's a Z module. And it's just, uh, I'm always going to write K. So it's just Z linear combinations of symbols uh, that look like this, A in brackets, where A is some object in the category. Modulo a few relations. The relations are just that the, the symbol for A is equal to the symbol for B. Uh, whenever A is isomorphic to B in the category. And at this point, maybe it doesn't matter, but it will in just a little while, so, so I'll say it now. Uh, the symbol for A direct sum B, if the category you're working in has some notion of direct sums of objects, which we don't so far in Templi leave, the symbol for the direct sum should just be the sum of the, the symbols. OK, so that's all I'm going to say for the Grotendieck group. In particular, um, maybe I'm meant to call this the split Grotendieck group because it, usually the definition of Grotendieck group says something about short exact sequences, but I want to work in, in a generality where there's no such thing as a short exact sequence. So we'll just use this. OK, so the point to make here is that Templi Lieb is a tensor category whose home spaces, and I'll, I'll keep writing home open circle because we're about to see the other one, whose, whose home spaces are, uh, are Z modules. In particular, they're ZQQ inverse modules, but we can forget the Q and just think of them as Z modules. Uh, so what we should do, let's look for C, a tensor category, whose home spaces are themselves categories. So when we take, uh, take the Grotendieck group, or the Grotendieck group of each of these home spaces, we recover temporary leave. Okay, so that's the goal. We're, 
Uh, well, notice that this C wasn't quite the same thing. Up there I said C star. We're going to go in two steps. We'll find a C that works like this, but then we're going to have to look a little bit harder for an even better C star that, uh, that lets us talk about gradings. Okay. Does this make sense, this idea of a tensor category whose home spaces themselves are a collection of objects and a collection of morphisms between them? And we can take the Grundy group of each of those home spaces and turn that little category sitting, uh, remember, uh, in Templi Lieb, home from 4 to 2 was just some collection of diagrams. Now, home from 4 to 2 is going to be some little category. And we can, we'll, we'll want to be taking the Grotendieck group of that category. So I think if what we're after is OK, uh, we can just start producing it. Now define C as a tensor category. Okay, so again, uh, the objects of C are just the natural numbers. Now, home from n to m will be. Very similar to what I had up there, but not quite. Uh, I'm not going to take linear combinations of anything. This is just going to be a set. And it's just going to be, uh, I'll, I'll draw exactly what I drew up there, in fact. It's just a set of all diagrams that you can draw in the rectangle like this with the right number of boundary points, n on the bottom, m on the top. No linear combinations are allowed here. Uh, and there are no relations. Forget about anything you know about the circle equal, being equal to Q plus Q inverse there. In fact, may, I didn't say it before, but we probably should just consider these diagrams up to isotopy. Uh, but over here, I can just take every single diagram, exactly how it's drawn. It's a different object. It's a different element of this set. But let me add one more little thing uh, to these objects. Uh, I'm allowed to write in front of a diagram just some power of, of Q. No linear combinations, but each, each diagram is, comes with a, an integer attached, Q, written as Q to the K. OK, this has told you a set of objects, but really, I want uh, home circle M to N to be a category. So if I want it to be a category, I need to tell you the morphisms between these, these elements, and I need to tell you how to compose the morphisms. I'm going to start using this other notation. Here's the filled in dot. It's the sort of. Yes? Uh, no, so sorry. Uh, where on the board that I just erased, there was a relation that you can remove circles in exchange for a factor of Q plus Q inverse. That's gone. Uh, there are obviously infinitely many objects here in this set because you can have as many circles you, as you like, nested however you like. And they're all distinct elements with no relations between them. We're, we're about to recover all of that. Uh, but, uh, well, by thinking about these home spaces rather than thinking about relations here. OK, so now I'm about to define the home in the new direction, the homes between these objects. Uh, OK, so here I'm just writing D for some diagram like in that set. This is going to be uh, the vector space. So C linear combinations of things in here. It, it doesn't really matter what you write here. Um, for today, I want it to be a field, but you can make it work over the, over the integers as well. 
Uh, so what's here? It surfaces in, uh, well, the square that these diagrams are all written in, cross I, uh, with boundary, the union of the two diagrams. I'll draw an example in a moment so you can see exactly what I mean there. With Euler characteristic, oh, sorry, uh, I need to say one more thing. Uh, with dots, so I'm allowed to draw some, some dots on my surface. Uh, with Euler characteristic, um, I'll get this wrong if I don't look. Uh, I, I'm perennially confused by this formula. Okay. Okay. Um, let's make sure we know all of the, the, the constituents here. K and K prime are just whatever numbers I have, happen to have written out the front here. Two times the number of dots, that's just these dots that are living on the surface. What are N and M here? Well, D and D prime uh, both look like some diagram with n points on the bottom and n points on the top. They're two different diagrams, but they have the same, the same boundary. And I got all the signs right. Modulo some local relations, which I'll come back to in a moment. And they're what make everything tick. But just before that, let me just do an example. Okay, everyone can see that. That's meant to be a, a saddle. This is a home in this filled in circle direction from, remember I read from the bottom to the top, so it's from this diagram to this diagram. But I need to put a Q here before it's an element of this home space, or otherwise this little formula won't work out. Maybe I should just check this formula in this case. Let's see. The Euler characteristic is 1. This is just a disk. Uh, what goes on the right-hand side? k is 0. k prime is, uh, is 1. There are no dots. And what are n and m? Well, these both go from 2 points to 2 points. So this number is 2. So we end up on the right side, negative 1 plus 2. So we got that one right. OK. Uh, and another example, just a... Uh, a sheet with a dot on it is an element of home from a single strand to q squared times a single strand. And as an exercise, you could check that uh, that gets the grading right as well. OK. Yeah. When I do wiki composition? M, M, the, the yes, OK, yeah. I, I guess I, I, I jumped ahead of myself here. Um, oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> the, the question was, when I do the composition in the open circle direction, say going from N to M here, what do I do with the factors of Q? And I, I'm admitting that I, that I jumped ahead of myself there. Uh, I've got to tell you the tensor product structure. C is meant to be a tensor category just on the level of the objects here. If I want to compose two of these diagrams in the open circle direction, I stack the diagrams and I multiply the factors of Q. Yeah. If I want to tensor product two of these, these elements, I put the diagram side by side and I multiply the factors of Q. OK. Uh, yeah, so in the, I took a little shortcut there to, to write it down. Uh, I want you to collapse the vertical components of the, of this surface, the, of the, the boundary of the surface, so those four vertical lines. And then you'll see that the boundary of the surface really is those two arcs, which are D prime, and these two arcs, which are D. So really, I should say, with boundary D union D prime, union uh, the vertical lines over all the boundary points, then, it, then it's, uh, it's more correct. Okay. So let's jump in 
to these local relations. Okay, just before I say the local relations, I just told you a moment ago how I compose and take tensor products of the objects in this, this category here. I just want to point out that there are three directions. Uh, we, can, uh, we can combine these surfaces. And I'll just draw the little uh, schematic so you can keep track of what all the symbols mean. You can put pictures side by side. Uh, so that would correspond to say, you would imagine taking, uh, um, or you could imagine gluing another surface onto the side, joining along these two vertical components of the boundary. That might be a tensor product direction. You can also compose what used to be up the board for these pictures, but I guess is kind of back into the board once I'm drawing things in 3D. And that's the, the old composition. But I can also take two of these surfaces from one diagram to another, and I can stack it on top of another surface from this top diagram to the next one. And that's the composition in the new internal direction, which I'm drawing like that. Okay, so now I need the local relations. What time did I start? 7.10, okay. Okay. So what are the local relations? The first one is that if I see a sphere anywhere inside one of these, I set that equal to zero. Uh, if I see a circle, a, a sphere, sorry, with a single dot on it, I set that equal to one. If I see anywhere at all on some sheet of the surface, two dots near each other, I set that equal to zero. Uh, I wrote this intermediate step in between because that's what most of, uh, well, much of tomorrow's talk will be about the possibility of not setting this equal to zero and looking at deformations of this setup. And then the final relation is that any time you see a tube, you can take this and rewrite it as the sum of two surfaces. Remember we're allowing C linear combinations of surfaces here. Where in each of these terms, we've replaced the tube with just two disks capping off the boundary circles. And in one term, there's a dot on one side, and in the other term, there's a dot on the other side. Okay. These kind of uh, seem strange, and I, I apologize for the fact that uh, the way I'm introducing this today, there's, there's not much motivation for these relations at the moment that I introduce them. But let me show you now a fantastic consequence of these relations. Yes, I, okay, the, let me repeat the question. Uh, I, the question was, am I considering these surfaces up to isotopy? Or that's, that's uh, maybe a slight rephrase of the question. Yes. So here, two surfaces which just differ by an isotopy in, inside, leaving the boundary fixed, I think of as this, exactly the same elements of the vector space. Maybe I should write that. And isotopy real boundary. Are you also assuming that all the boundaries either on the edges or vertical? Yes, sorry. Uh, the, the boundary really is exactly uh, the, the source and target diagrams and the vertical intervals joining up the the n plus m boundary points. Yeah, and that's, that's all of the boundary. The boundary is exactly that. Sorry. <laughs> the, alpha is zero. Uh, the, your, your question is, what is alpha? The, the point is, tomorrow, we're going to come back and think about what happens if we look at a non-zero uh, complex value for, for alpha, or if we just set alpha to be some, some formal parameter. But that's for tomorrow. For today, uh, anytime you see two dots, it's zero.
You'll notice, though, that nothing that I say the rest of the day actually depends on alpha being zero. So you don't need to do that if you don't want to. Okay. Before I can show you the wonderful consequence of these relations, I need to do one awkward technical thing. Uh, let's go to the matrix category. So what does this mean? We allow formal direct sums of objects. So where before, oops, I seem to have lost that board. I guess I just erased it. Before the objects in this filled in dot category, the new category we're defining, were just these temporary lieb like diagrams with a factor of Q out the front. But now I want to be able to write something like Q times this guy, direct sum, uh, Q cubed times this guy. Okay? So obje the objects now, I I'm allowed to write lists of, of the objects I had before. And the morphisms between direct sums are matrices of the old morphisms. So I guess I should do a quick example. Um, well, let's do a really boring example that might be too boring to actually illustrate anything. Say I have a single vertical strand, direct sum itself, and I want to think about what are the maps to here. Well, an example of an element of a morphism from here to here might be, uh, oh, maybe I should put some cues here. Um, so, so it's, yeah, it's the, 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 the question was, uh, which category are we taking the matrix category of? So for each uh, home from N to M that we're looking at, we've got some category of pictures and morph the morphisms of surfaces between them. It's that category which we're taking matrices over. So I'm taking direct sums of the objects that were, that were in that category, and the morphisms I'm now allowing uh, matrices of morphisms. Let me make this slightly more interesting by putting in some factors of Q. Uh, that might be a morphism here. This matrix entry is just a map from this direct sum and to that direct sum and, and so on. Okay. You'll see when we get to an example uh, why we need this and how it works. And, and it's, uh, don't, don't, don't let this be worrying, if it's at all worrying at this point. Okay, now we can, we can observe the, the nice consequence of these local relations. Okay. So the circle, this is an object in the category home zero to zero. Okay? Zero boundary points on the top, zero boundary points on the top. This is isomorphic. This object in that category is isomorphic to the direct sum of Q inverse times the empty diagram and Q times the empty diagram. And here's the proof. I'm just going to show you the isomorphism. Well, what are the homes from the, these are the filled in circle homes, the surfaces. What are the homes from here to here? Well, it's just some surface whose lower boundary is the, uh, uh, is the circle, whose upper boundary is empty. So for example, I could just take a little disk and cap off the circle. Let me uh, make sure I put the dots in the right places. Okay. So I claim that this map you could write this as a little uh, one by two matrix if you wanted to, but I've just written out the, uh, the entries of the matrix on separate arrows. This is some home from here to here, and I claim it's an isomorphism. And to show you that it's an isomorphism, I'll just show you the inverse as well. 
which are these maps from the empty diagram back to the circle. So it's just a little disk creating a circle. And there's a dot on one and not on the other. So let's, um, well, I guess one exercise is to check that all of the Euler characteristics work out according to the formula that we have for Euler characteristics. Let's just check one of the compositions. Let's look what we do when we start at the circle, apply this map, then apply this map again. So we just have to compose this map and that map. What do I get? Well, I get a sum because I'm multiplying matrices here. I do this matrix entry times that one. But I also have to do this matrix entry times that one. Okay? And by that relation, the last relation over on the list of local relations, that linear combination of surfaces with dots is just equal to the cylinder, which is the identity on the circle. Okay? So a homework exercise is to do the composition the other way around. Start here and do this map followed by this map. You get a little two-by-two two matrix and check that it's the identity matrix. Okay. So this should look great. Okay? What's going on here? Back in Templi Lieb, we had an identity. Circle equals Q plus Q inverse. But now, in this categorified world we're trying to live in, we have an isomorphism. Circle is isomorphic to Q direct sum, Q inverse. So you can see that when we take the Grotendieck group in a moment, we're going to recover the relation in Templi Lieb. Circle equals Q plus Q inverse. Okay. Uh, so I guess let me, let me say that as a, as a theorem on this board. Let's take the Grotendieck group of this category C that we've just defined. So here I mean take the Grotendieck group in each home space. Each home end to M, take the Grotendieck group of that category. This is just the same as Templi Lieb as a tensor category. Uh, there's a little bit more to check in this theorem than this. This theorem guarantees that whatever the Grotendieck group is, it looks like Z linear combinations of Templi Lieb diagrams and circle equals Q plus Q inverse holds, but you might worry that there are even more relations in the Grotendieck group. So you have to do a little bit of work, but that is actually quite easy, which I won't tell you about right now, uh, and see that these really are the same thing. And so in some sense, we've categorified Templi Lieb as a tensor category. Okay, so happily this board is still here. Really, we want to categorify Templi Lieb as a braided tensor category. But there's a little bit of a problem. The, the main problem is that these formulas for the crossings here have negative signs in them. And so it's unclear what object in curly C we could associate to a crossing because we can only take direct sums of objects. There's no direct minuses. Uh, the idea here is it's just it's hard to categorify a ring, but easy to categorify a rig. And we have a real problem. So there's a solution to this. And uh, I wish it were better motivated. And if people out there have better motivations, um, they should tell me about them because I, I'm curious as to why it's so essential to, to do this. We've, we've already categorized, categorified Templi Lieb. Why do we have to do this next funny step to get a braiding? So let's go to the homotopy category. So I called my gadget before C. Now I'm going to call this new gadget C star. So what, what's the homotopy category? Well, if I have any old category, uh, maybe I better have a category where uh, um, where the, the morphism spaces are, are linear. So it makes sense to say something like d squared equals zero. I can, um, I can look at instead all of the complexes in that category. And I can, so I can replace the objects with complexes in the category and I can replace the morphisms with chain maps between complexes. So let's see exactly what this is. So hom, so now we're talking about this new thing, C star, not C. Uh, yeah, and I, I want to tell you the open circle direction. Remember in C, this hom space was just formal direct sums of Templi Lieb diagrams. Now, this is, uh, 
complexes in so just complexes in the old category that we had and the morphisms so I'm writing a set of objects and a set of morphisms acting on those objects are the chain maps uh, mod homotopy okay that's probably all a bit strange and weird. So uh, I guess before I do an example which will make it unstrange again, I need to fix a few problems that I've introduced by wanting to talk about this strange gadget. Oh, sorry, I should have, uh, maybe I, this is probably better if I actually write n to m here. I'm telling you for each n and m what this thing is that I'm what this, this new category is. Okay. Uh, well, for each N and M, we've produced this crazy gadget here. But the whole thing C star is meant to be a tensor category. So I have to be able to take uh, an element of this home space, which is some crazy complex of somewhere else, and I need to be able to compose it with another object in, in, in one of these home spaces. If I have an object in home from n to m and another object in home m to k, I need to be able to compose them. Similarly, I need to be able to take tensor products as well. So let's do that. And again, unfortunately, this is something where uh, an example would help a lot. So, well, okay. So to, to open circle compose or tensor product two complexes you have to take the homological tensor product which I'll remind you in, of in a moment take the homological tensor product Combining chain groups and differentials. Well, the reason I put chain groups in scare quotes there is that I just wanted, if I have some complex, I want names for the, the bits that come here. But of course, in the complexes that I'm talking about, those aren't groups or vector spaces or anything else. They are object here, that is, temporary leave diagrams with a, uh, a factor of Q attached. But chain groups just means the, the, the pieces of the complex. And so let me just do an example that will hopefully make this perfectly clear. Say I had some little complex here, and I want to compose it, say, with another complex. Let me introduce a little bit of notation and underline indicates uh, homological height zero. Okay, so let me put an underline there and there. So this is a complex that's concentrated in height zero and one. This thing here is the following. That's the bit in height zero. So I've just, uh, in, each, in each spot here, I've taken an, a, an object from one complex and an object from the other one, and I've combined them using the operation here. This same example works just as well with tensor product here, as well as the open circle composition. And what are all of the, the maps here? Well, this is uh, F open circle, the identity on C. This is the identity on B, open circle G. This is uh, the identity on A, open circle uh, uh, G. And this is minus uh, F, open circle, the identity on D. Okay, what's going on here? Well, what, what are all these identities? Just let me remind you, the objects in here are just temporary Lieb diagrams with a factor of Q out the front. 
And so the identity here is just the surface because the cylinder over that temporary leave diagram. Okay, why did I put a sign here? Well, if you don't know and love these signs when you take homological tensor products of complexes, um, go and read Gilfand and Menin's homological algebra book, which is great and tells you, it has a little appendix which tells you how to remember all the little conventions. Um, or in the lecture notes, I wrote down a rule that lets you remember where to sprinkle the minus signs. But the real answer is, the answers you get are isomorphic as long as you put the right number of minus signs in. Uh, let, me, let me skate over that. Okay. Sorry? Okay, the, the, the question then is what on earth are the differentials in these complexes? And let me finally do an example and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, now I'm going to define the braiding and the, the braiding will give you an example. Okay. Here's a crossing, the positive crossing. And what I'm going to say is, oops, sorry, no orientations there. Is that the positive crossing gets sent to this complex. The objects are just the objects in the category we were used to before, temporary leave diagrams with factors of Q. And the differential here is just some morphism in the category that we got used to, some surface between this diagram and this diagram. And I'm telling you that it's meant to be the saddle. Okay? This is automatically a complex. D squared is zero because it's only got two steps. One step, however you want to count. Okay. And for the negative crossing, uh, I'll tell you that this is the definition I want to use. Okay. Does that answer your question? You, <laughs> the, the complexes that we're thinking about are just complexes in the old category that we were looking at. They're just a sequence of objects from the old category and a sequence of morphisms from the old category between them, subject to the condition that d squared has to be zero. Um, let me, uh, well, I, I think since this is looking confusing, uh, let me do an example, uh, which um, you, you can consider an exercise too. I'm doing your homework for you. Let's, uh, let's check that this definition of the, of the braiding makes sense by checking some Rademeister moves. Well, what complex do we associate to this tangle? Well, we know what complex we associate to the crossing in here. So all that we do is, uh, well, uh, we have to just take the crossing and add a strand on the right. So if we take that, that complex over there, and this is the complex that we associate to this little tangle. Okay? Now, here, I can use this isomorphism that I previously had on this board. I know that any object with a circle in it is isomorphic to the direct sum of two, two objects without the circles. So all that I did here was replaced some object in the complex with some isomorphic object. But I have to work out what the new maps are. Well, what's the map that goes here? It's the map, it's the, the piece of the isomorphism from this direct sum into here followed by that differential. This is just what you do when you replace an object in a complex with something isomorphic. Uh, so the differentials here are just the surfaces, sheet with a dot and sheet without a dot. And I guess the bit that I'll leave for an exercise is that this thing then is homotopy equivalent to just a single strand. You can sort of cancel off this piece of the differential. And so that was a piece of, of Rademeister invariance. I think an excellent exercise is to do this over and over again until you uh, understand what's going on and you believe that that's the right calculation to be doing. Okay, I have five minutes left today. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, okay. Sorry, over here, this is a, 
this is a this is an open circle. The the home space from endpoints to endpoints is this huge category here. Okay? It's the category Remember, maybe let me write back over here what the corresponding thing with, uh, with, uh, without the star was. If we're just looking at C, the open circle home from M to N, this is the objects here are things of the form Q to the K and some temporary Lieb diagram. And the morphisms here are surfaces mod relations. Okay, that's what the, the open circle home was from end to end before. And what we've done now is we've replaced that with complexes in this category here. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and really here I want to allow direct sums of these guys and matrices here. The, the, the reason for needing direct sums, oh, sorry, I, I left out something here which, which is kind of essential. Um, I should have written a big direct sum there. So this thing that I've written on the right here is a complex concentrated in three different homological heights. And the reason why I needed to allow direct sums of objects is precisely so I can do this sort of operation. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to say is we've crept up on Kravanov homology. Uh, all that you do is take your link and think of it as an element of this home space in C star from zero points to zero points. And it's some crazy complex. Okay? We don't quite have time uh, today, so I'll continue in the next lecture to say this. Uh, tomorrow, we'll see that this thing where we naturally end up sticking our, our links, this home space from zero to zero, is actually just, remember this is some category, it's actually equivalent as a category to the collection of bigraded vector spaces. And, uh, just like we did for the Jones polynomial, we stuck our link into some home space of some category, then we identified that home space is something nice and easy, Laurent polynomials. Uh, we need to think a little bit more about how to get this identification, and then we'll have extracted a bigraded vector space from a link, which is what uh, originally you might have expected I was going to tell you today. Uh, so that we'll have to leave for tomorrow. Um, and... Yeah, I guess I'll leave everything else for tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll, we'll finish doing this, talk about how this funny abstract nonsense thing actually gives us a quite concrete invariant from a link. And then I'll talk a little bit about functoriality, a little bit about deformations with that parameter alpha, and hopefully I'll get to tell you what the S invariant of a knot is. And uh, that'll be the end of tomorrow. Okay, thanks. <laughs>